All right, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I am going to start now. Um, now I just have to figure out how to share my screen because I'm an idiot. Share screen. All right, so we're going to be talking today about Civil Commitment 101. Um, this is the, the third in our Speed Caser series. I don't know everyone in the office because there's been a lot of new hires, but I just wanted to let you know I'm Lauren from the Appeals section. And for those of you who don't know me, um, there will be a lot of cat memes today. So what are we gonna cover? First, what is Civil Commitment? How does the state civilly commit our clients? What is our role and how do we end it? What is civil commitment? Civil commitment happens only after your client is declared both incompetent to stand trial and has been opined not restorable to competency. And the doctor finds that your client is a danger to himself or others or gravely disabled. When we're talking about gravely disabled, we're talking about can't feed or dress himself. Um, this is where the poop throwers uh, fit into the mix. When is a client civilly committed? It can be any time after DBHDD determines your client is both incompetent and not restorable. This happening sooner after just a few weeks or a few months happens when your client is usually um, developmentally disabled and has an IQ of 30 and we know he's not getting any better so we don't have to try things. Um, but more likely than not, it'll happen about a year after your client enters DBHDD. That's when it must happen. They can't wait longer than a year. There is some debate whether it's a year from the IST order or a year from entrance into DBHDD, there isn't case law directly on point. My reading of the statute, it's a year from the IST order, but practice has been a year after your client enters DBHDD. If this is particularly important to your specific client situation, we can talk about um, addressing that. How is a client civilly committed? What usually happens is you, the court, and the state get a report from DBHDD that your client is civilly committable. Again, not competent, not restorable, and civilly committable. There's a whole nother group of people which are not competent, not restorable, and not civilly committable, which are, have a whole host of other issues, but we're specifically talking about what are referred to as the not, not, yes. Not competent, not restorable, but yes, civilly committable. Then the court must have a hearing to determine whether or not your client is civilly committable. So what happens at that hearing? First, the state must move for civil commitment. Um, it is their job to make the motion. They're the ones who are trying to keep your client in. They must put on evidence, usually from an expert testimony of a psychiatrist or a psychologist. They must prove by clear and convincing evidence and I don't wanna to go to law 101, but we're looking at the three standards, preponderance of the evidence, just above 50%, proof beyond a reasonable doubt way up here and then clear and convincing is in the middle. You can rebut the state's evidence with your own expert. So you don't have to rely on their expert. If you have an expert that's gonna say, no, that's not what's going on, you can. We don't do that a lot, but it is totally an option. The rules of evidence apply. This is important because lots of times they wanna come in and read the police report and say, look what your client did, that's why he's a danger. Um, the rules of evidence apply. So while experts can rely on hearsay in making their opinions, that doesn't make the hearsay um, substantive. And if they come in and talk about that, um, about what actually happened at the incident, that um, you object. The judge is the fact finder at the hearing and the decision is directly appealable. 
The next question is that I get a lot is, but my client is really crazy and I don't want to object. I, I want him to be civilly committable, committed. I'm sorry, that is just not an option. That is not something that we can consent to. The only time you can is if your client can actually say to you, I want to stay in DBHDD custody. If your client can't actually verbalize affirmative consent and or he says he wants to go home, it's your job to argue for that. I know that this is a little wonky because we think that incompetent clients don't really have a say, but in this realm, they do. And so even though they're not competent to make hardly any decisions, they are competent to make, well, they're not competent, but they are able to make this decision. But it strictly their decision is, do I want a hearing or do I not want a hearing? If they tell you nothing, the baseline is have a hearing and hold them to their burden. You must do this even if it feels wrong. And if the state comes in and screws it up and brings no evidence because they sometimes do because they're idiots, you argue for your client to go home. You don't get to do anything other than that. So there's also outpatient civil commitment. Most of our clients are inpatient, which means they're in the hospital, but the state is required to prove that the hospital is needed. It's the you need to prove that it's the least restrictive means to keep your clients locked, to keep your clients safe. Um, and that there's not an outpatient option available. So unlike some other things, make doing the least restrictive includes kind of financial um financial stuff. So we don't want to say like, well, you just don't have the money um, to pay for outpatient treatment. So, you know, it's your responsibility. Actually, right in the statute, it says that there has to be alternatives that are reasonable, available, and available means whether they can provide it. So it's not just the, but we want to, and they should be able to. If you had the right group home, he would leave. He could leave. They actually have to have the right group home and be able to pay for it. But if they do, they should send your client there. If the court agrees to outpatient civil commitment, there are usually parameters in that order that state if something happens, they can immediately move your client back inpatient um, and then later have a hearing. When I've had outpatient civil commitment, um, the orders usually say upon request of the social worker, doctor, or um, person at the group home, or the police, they can take your client immediately into inpatient custody, not to the jail, but to the hospital, the inpatient side. And then you get a hearing a week or two later, or seven, you, know, you could write it as 72 hours or a week, whatever your judge wants to sign. Um, so there are those kind of backup things to keep your client safe, which is one of the ways you can convince your um, judge that outpatient is appropriate. How long can they keep your client in civil commitment? For 45 days after a finding of not competent and non-restorable, but not longer than one year if the case is a misdemeanor. This is important. They cannot keep your, your client at all longer than a year in, if it's a misdemeanor. They have to let your client go. Um, and after your client has been found not competent and not restorable, they only have 45 days to bring the hearing if this is a misdemeanor. For a nonviolent felony, either the maximum possible sentence of the most serious charge, not the amount of time consecutive. So if your client has seven entering autos, it's just the one, um, or five years, whichever is shorter. I had a case where my client was charged with a criminal attempt to commit entering auto. And so at two and a half years, they had to let my client go. They couldn't keep them any longer. For a violent felony, the maximum possible sentence of the most serious charge, again, not consecutive to each other. Um, myself and Suzanne actually had a client charged with multiple aggravated assaults. He stabbed people in his prior group home and they were all um, aggravated assaults. And he has been in civil commitment for 14 years now. So six more years and he's out of there. You get a yearly review. In fact, you must have a yearly review every year 
for your clients. Um, those yearly reviews are the exact same hearing that we talked about before. All of those qualifications happen at that hearing. This is something that it, you know we often kind of fall behind on, but it's your responsibility to keep up with your clients who need a yearly review. This is really important when you switch caseloads. We don't think of these clients as active clients, but they are, they're in custody somewhere and you need to kind of keep track of them. Keep a calendar and make sure you get the report and the hearing scheduled every year. What has a tendency to happen is like at 13 or 14 months, you'll get a report from um, DBHDD and then six months after that, your judge will schedule a hearing. That's not okay. Your clients get the hearing every year. You need to ask for the report. You need to schedule the hearing or ask the court to schedule it. You also need to talk to your client. At very least, you should have a yearly phone call with your client and his or her doctor. And if your client is local, you need to go visit them at Georgia Regional. Obviously, post-COVID safety applies. But if when we're in a place where we can go do that, you need to go and see them. This is something your social workers can help you with. Generally, when I go to Georgia Regional, I have my social worker set it up for me, um, calling over there. Uh, and talking to the social worker there, kind of getting a lay of the land, knowing who the doctor is, knowing when the doctor is going to be there. So you can make kind of one visit, one visit to both see your client and talk to the doctor. Um, but it's important, these are your clients, you gotta talk to them. And sometimes you go and they won't talk to you and they turn around and walk the other way or won't even come out to see you. It's still your responsibility to try. Um, just like you go to the jail and some of the clients won't show up in the booth, you got to go there. You got to make the effort. You, and sometimes even if you go every year, they eventually recognize your face um, and will want to talk to you more. Transfer to probate court. This is something that we want to happen if possible. At any point, the trial court can dead docket the case or dismiss it or ask the state to null process it. Okay. If they do so, this, the judge can order your client be immediately transferred from adult mental health to the forensic unit of DBHDD. Excuse me, I did that backwards. From the forensic unit of DBHDD to the mental health, adult mental health unit. Um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but basically there are two separate areas if you go to Georgia Regional or any one of these hospitals. There's the forensic unit that are more locked down and then there is adult mental health, which is also locked down, but kind of in a different way. Um, and so they're both there. And so if your client, if, if the court case is over, um, your client can go over to adult mental health. In the adult mental health unit, the doctors will de determine if your client meets the commitment of uh, criteria for civil commitment. And they'll also assign an advocate to your client. So they get representation. It's just not through the criminal case. Um, so they have those options. Why is it better? One, the commitment's up to a probate judge and doctors. It has nothing to do with the criminal case. It takes the state and your trial judge and the complaining witnesses completely out of the picture. They don't get a say at all. And no judge has to worry about, no trial judge has to worry about, you let this crazy person out. It's an entirely different system and they have responsibility to do that. Um, also probate court, they're very focused on actually making decisions about your client, about when they are civilly committable and when they're not. And they don't have to wait for a report or anything else. The doctor goes to the advocate and the probate judge and says time for them to go. And they have that hearing fairly quickly. Um, this is a note, probate court is where your client is housed, not, so it's where the hospital is. So most of our clients go to the DeKalb probate court because that's where Georgia Regional is, but also Savannah and Macon and Milledgeville. Um, they don't stay here with us, which is another thing that you can tell your judge because it is, he doesn't have to go down the hall and see the probate judge and say you're transferring all your people. It's a whole nother courthouse. How you want to convince your judges to let your client go. So we talked about the time limits. Time's up. You got to do it. You explain to your judge that 
the custodian of your client, whether it's the jail or DBHDD, are required by law to 1013 your client um, if he is a danger. Nothing bad is going to happen. They don't let people back on the streets. I mean, let me be honest, they do, um, but that's not what you tell your judge because they're not legally allowed to, um, just like the jail isn't legally allowed to do lots of things that they sometimes do. But it is completely their responsibility to make that determination. You also tell them if your client is crazy as they being the doctors in the state say they are, probate isn't gonna let him go. And so he's just gonna be in another area. It's less work for both you, your case manager and the judge. Um, the judge, you tell them this is off your docket. You don't have to worry about this number. You never have to see him again. Um, and there is a system to support him out in the world. And eventually you're gonna to have to do it anyway, so why wait? Um, now, again, we're talking about release from forensic civil commitment. They can still be committed in probate court. Thank you so much. I appreciate you listening. Anyone have a question? Stop sharing. There's a chat, let me go to the chat. Oh, tiger meow. Yes. <laughs> Anyone have a question? We have some time um, about civil commitment or mental health stuff in general. Will you be emailing the PowerPoint out? Yes, I will be emailing the PowerPoint out. Um, I should, I think I recorded this so I can email the whole presentation. Thank you. Okay, Scarborough asks, what remedies are there than when the court won't set a timely hearing, mandamus or appealable? Yeah, it's mandamus, it's like anything else. And you can also move for immediate release of your client. They have not had their hearing in a year. So release them because you haven't made a showing. It's the state's burden and they haven't made a showing that your client is civilly committable. Again, everything is on the state. So you can file a motion for immediate release. Uh, wait, okay. There's some questions. Okay. Um, so yes, Quanda says as a reminder, if you have a civil commitment case, um, they should be assigned to your social worker for tracking um, and um, are also available to come into the hearing and help. That is incredibly important. Um, generally, I have a social worker sit next to me, sometimes in between me and the client, because a lot of our clients are very talky um, and they want to have their voices heard, which is great, but your social worker can help have that kind of conversation while you continue with the hearing. Uh, Shamal asks, with the time limits, are they for sentencing rages at the time of the offense? Yes, it's the maximum sentence at the time of arrest. So whatever your client could have been sentenced to when your client was arrested, just like what that's the same thing about what your client could have been sentenced to generally if you had a case. Anything else? I appreciate you all coming. I hope these trainings have been helpful. Um, and we're gonna keep, uh, oh, maybe you already addressed this, but what about when your client has already served the maximum time? You file a motion for immediate release. They can't. And you can talk about transfer to probate court. Your order can say transfer to adult mental health. Um, if still no one would do it, this is where habeas has come in. Um, I am habeas adverse right now, as some of you <laughs> may know from earlier, uh, from about a year ago, um, but sometimes it is what you gotta do. Um, what can you do in the event of the delay of report? Yeah, you have your judge or you go to your judge and say, we need one. You call over to the hospital, you say, we need one. And then again, the DBHDD is part of the state. So when they don't do their job, you file something and say, they have not proven that my client should be civilly committed anymore. So obviously they don't care very much and need to let them go. 
it's since everything that happens is their burden, you know, you flip it on them as much as you can. Anything else? All right. Well, I assuming Zoom worked, I have this recorded and one of my intrepid uh, appellate friends, I think knows how to put it on YouTube with like a private link so anyone can watch it. Um, and I'll also attach the PowerPoint um, itself as well. Um, so if there's nothing else, you can always email me. You should have um, the cheat sheet, which has all of this in it. Um, and if there's, a, you can always email, text, call. I have on my door in the office, if you walk by, it has all of my information on it. Um, and I'm right next to Liz's office. So you're always welcome to get in touch. And now that, you know, things are hopefully getting better, um, I'll be back in the office more soon. All right. Thanks so much. Oh, wait. Oh, that was just a thank you. Okay. Thank you.